evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is away. Ontario grapples with the testing backlog in the tens of thousands. We understand how urgently this needs to be addressed. The new measures to fix it and why we're running out of time. We may have to talk about restricting who gets tested even more. Parts of Quebec become a red zone with new restrictions and the numbers continue to spike. If we have to be closed, we have to be closed. Politicians try to chart the path forward as Canada wearily limps through the second wave at issue, looks at how they're doing. And introducing Ms. Marvel, a Canadian teen bound for superhero stardom. This is The Nation. With Canada's COVID cases rising, so too are efforts to stop the virus in its tracks and contain the financial fallout seven months into this pandemic. Today, the federal government laid out a multi-billion dollar plan to help Canada's economic recovery. But the virus itself is still dominating in Quebec and Ontario. One facing an unprecedented testing backlog, the other now instituting tough new restrictions. There's new science, too, that suggests more cases might be tied to fewer people. We'll get there, but let's start with Magda Gabrasalasa and Ontario's testing backlog. Evita Walton's son is supposed to be in school today, but some symptoms got in the way. He had a runny nose this morning, so uh, we and a bit of a stomach ache, so he can't go to school until we get it cleared. She may be waiting for a while. The province is struggling with a backlog of 82,000 tests, and time is ticking. These specimens are only uh, good for three days, and then they spoil, and uh, people have to be retested. So we understand how urgently this needs to be addressed. The government says it's turning to university labs for help, while reminding people to abide by the testing guidelines. If you aren't showing symptoms, uh, please just don't, don't go get tested. As of today, kids with runny noses no longer make the cut either. In the vast, vast majority of cases, it is not COVID-19. Those kids are being told to stay home. And if they have two or more symptoms, parents are told to seek the advice of a health care provider first. As for what's needed to go back to school once clear of symptoms... Schools and daycare should not be requiring a negative COVID test. Uh, in fact, they shouldn't even require a doctor's note. It's essential that we have rapid turnaround. This infectious disease physician thinks this move will help clear an already clogged system. We may have to talk about restricting who gets tested even more. Uh, and again, finding those low risk to public health, but still positive people to just isolate at home for 14 days uh, and, and, uh, and focus on the symptomatic people. But with the focus and messages changing almost daily, it's confusing for parents like Evita Walton. When I was reading through what the criteria were for testing, I didn't see how they were going to tell us not to. She's now heading home and hoping for a negative result. Magda Gebrasilesa, CBC News, Toronto. Now, most of Ontario's new cases are in the greater Toronto area and Ottawa. The Premier was asked today if restaurants in those areas could soon face more restrictions, like shutting down indoor dining. Not right now. Uh, again, everything's on the table. If you ask me, you know, in four days and we're up over a thousand, things could change, but not, not right now. We just want everyone to continue following the, the guidelines. The province has said any further restrictions would be targeted rather than a rollback to stage two. In Quebec today, a lot of targeted restrictions took effect. Red zone rules went into effect in three areas, including Montreal. Alison Northcott with the change and the confusion. For the bar, we've done the same thing. For the second time since the pandemic began, David Ferguson's restaurant is shut down. We're not an essential service. The schools are, the hospitals are. So if we have to be closed, we have to be closed. Restaurants are allowed to do takeout and delivery, but his doesn't. So it's one of an estimated 12,000 businesses in so-called red zones closed or with limited services for the next 28 days. We've made some tough decisions in recent days, but they are lives in danger. The province announced money today to support businesses forced to close. Loans up to 80% forgivable to help cover fixed costs like municipal taxes, insurance and rent. 
The Quebec Restaurant Association says it might help some struggling restaurants stay afloat, but it's concerned about the long run for others. In downtown Montreal, you know, there's no workers, and there's no university student, there's no tourists in downtown Montreal. It's very a tough spot. Movie theaters, museums, casinos and bars are also closed for the month. And gatherings with people from different households are no longer permitted. But many aren't sure what will be considered a gathering. It confuses the population, what's allowed, what's not allowed. In red zones, there are a lot of questions about what you can do and what could now earn you a $1,000 fine. I'm not too clear on the rules. All I can say is that, you know, you allow one thing and not another, but sometimes you don't understand why. The province says the rules can't address every possible social scenario, so it's asking people to use their judgment and just avoid social gatherings. The only way to put is to put the brakes by lowering socialization and contacts in between persons. Ferguson says he's hoping to welcome customers back in 28 days, but he's also bracing himself for more shutdowns in the months ahead. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Ontario and Quebec accounted for more than 80% of all the new COVID cases in Canada today. Ontario recorded 538, Quebec 933, Alberta posted 173 new cases and a fifth death linked to outbreaks at Calgary's Foothills Medical Centre. Manitoba added 36 new cases and today it became the fifth province to activate the COVID Alert app, which can warn users if they've been in contact with a positive case. In northern Manitoba, an outbreak at a remote First Nation highlights a pretty frightening fact. Small Indigenous communities simply don't have the facilities to cope with escalating case numbers. Cameron McIntosh shows us a new measure for containing the spread. <laughs> They planned for this, now it's happening. An Indigenous-led COVID rapid response team, the first of its kind, dealing with a cluster in Manitoba's north, testing the entire community of York Factory First Nation. A five to seven day turnaround right now for those testing before we look at even any reopening plans for the school especially so. Chief Leroy Constant says a band member became infected while in Winnipeg for a medical appointment, then infected her family, who have had at least 65 community contacts. And it is a good example of how easily it can be picked up and how contagious it is. Led by the University of Manitoba's Ongamuzin Indigenous Health Institute, a doctor, three nurses and two therapists are conducting testing while the community locks itself down. It's the first time that this uh, uh, intervention has been done. Drastic measures to prevent a much bigger spread, says Dr. Barry Lavely. Where there's no place uh, to isolate safely or comfortably. Throughout the pandemic, there have been 683 positive cases on First Nations with 12 deaths. 120 cases are currently active. Overall, the test positivity rate remains below the Canadian average. We'll continue monitoring the situation quite closely. Thank you. The Indigenous Services Minister says situations like in York Factory are worrisome as a second wave looms. $2.2 billion has been allotted to deal with COVID in First Nations, including initiatives like the Rapid Response Team. Meanwhile, other communities already closed off are shutting down further. Manitoba's Pimichikamak Cree Nation is restricting all travel. We are trying to manage uh, how people are coming in and going in our community. So right now we had the complete lockdown. People uh, have to abide by the rules that we're, we're putting in place so just to keep the community safe. Still, leaders concede that's coming at a great emotional cost. The pressure and isolation many First Nations are feeling is leading to a COVID-induced mental health epidemic. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Now, key to stopping the spread of this virus is understanding who's likely to spread it. Christine Birak shows us a new study which suggests some people spread more than others. Health officials are seeing an increasing number of outbreaks. In Kingston, Ontario, at least five recent COVID-19 positive cases have been linked to a large party. At a 50-person wedding in Oshawa, eight cases and the couple has not handed over their guest list. You gotta give up the names, you know, and, until we can, we can contact Trace them. Tracers need to figure out who's spreading this virus. Scientists insist it's fewer people than you think. Not everyone spreads the same amount. Indian scientists conducted the largest COVID-19 contact tracing study in the world. It suggests the epidemic is being driven by a small number of infected people. It 
is known from the scientific literature that not everyone sheds virus the same way or that they have equal levels of viral load. Scientists tracked 85,000 COVID cases in India and over half a million of their contacts. They found 71% of people hadn't clearly transmitted the virus to anyone. Instead, 5% of people accounted for 80% of the infections. Super spreading events happen, and that's a, a, a reasonable term to define what's happening. Super spreading events aren't well understood. They're tough to study and the findings can stigmatize those who set them off. Experts say they can also be situational. You have, uh, for example, a wedding where there could be a lot of people in close contact with each other. Some of it might be individual factors and for whatever reason, some people are just able to uh, shed more virus than others. Typically, super spreading events take place in crowded indoor settings where people are face to face for long periods of time. If we have certain groups uh, within the public uh, aren't following the guidelines, it, it, it's very difficult. Experts say outbreaks will continue to spike. The weather is changing and people are moving indoors. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Meanwhile, a commercial rent relief program is officially over today. This was a lifeline for several small businesses across Canada, but it had its critics too. Jacqueline Hansen takes a closer look. Hello. Just hanging on the next few months will come at a cost for Karen McGilvray. I'm going to use my retirement savings to pay the rent because I want to keep the business going. I love the business. Up until now, she's only paid a small share of the rent for her climbing gym because her landlord applied for the federal rent relief. But that program is now over and she still needs support. I really need help with the fixed costs, which the rent is the biggest fixed cost. The new finance minister says the government is committed to helping with those costs, saying we are listening to you and we will have more to announce very soon. But for now, more uncertainty. How long are small business owners going to wake up every day and wonder when they're going to hear about what supports are available to them. For months, the advocacy group Save Small Business criticized the rent program that some tenants were shut out of because landlords could choose whether or not to apply. After months of trying to get Ottawa to make fixes, the group called it quits. We wanted a broad, uh, simple uh, rent relief program and we didn't get that. We got a complicated and narrow one. We're called Save Small Business and we didn't, uh, so we failed. They have a final urgent request for Ottawa. Don't replace the program with business loans. It has to be cash. It can't be more debt. Small businesses simply cannot take on more debt. Ottawa says 120,000 businesses benefited from the rent relief program for a total of about $1.7 billion, roughly half of what was budgeted. The landlord of Phil Chaw's escape room and cafe refused to apply. My business partner and I are in the area of $100,000 in debt. When it gets this big, you don't even really feel the numbers. It's just stress. Shaw wants the government to give him a chance to apply for the leftover money directly. Otherwise, with no hope in sight, there's very little point to keep on going. One challenge they won't be able to solve on their own. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Canadians living in the bigger provinces may be looking east with a tinge of envy. As COVID restrictions tighten in hotspots like Quebec, Ontario and the West, Nova Scotia is easing them. Kayla Hounsell has the details. He has to get dressed before he goes into the arena, but Jack Graham doesn't mind. I'm happy to be back at hockey. I miss it a lot. These tryouts not possible until today when the province increased the gathering limit from 10 to 50 with no physical distancing required. They are going to be able to go out, check, have face-off, have referees, have music playing, be like a rink. So I think it's fantastic. The Halifax Mooseheads are also returning with 2,000 fans in the stands. It's not our normal 10,500 screaming fans, but we're just so excited and thrilled to have fans back in the, the building. With only two cases of COVID in the province, some are calling for even more restrictions to be loosened. We need to relax a little bit to allow businesses to operate effectively uh, in what has become a special place in North America. The Halifax Chamber of Commerce wants to increase the two-person limit in elevators so more people who work in office towers can return. With patios closing, it also wants to allow more people inside restaurants and ease restrictions at the provincial border so people coming in don't have to isolate so long.
let's do some testing, let's allow people to get a test even in Ontario or in Quebec, and let's let them have a second test when they arrive in Nova Scotia. This infectious diseases specialist supports some changes, but urges vigilance. I mean, while the success of the bubble in the Atlantic provinces is just, it's, it's outstanding, um, it's outstanding for a reason. You know, I think if people get too cavalier or if policy gets too lax, it's, it's conceivable that the bubble could burst. These kids are hoping nothing happens to burst their bubble of excitement. I'm really happy we get to live in Nova Scotia where we're uh, doing it. I quote my mother here, uh, hockey is a privilege, not a right. A privilege they hope to keep enjoying for the rest of the season. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Dartmouth. So let's go now to Vancouver where Dan Burrett is standing by in our newsroom for some developing news. Dan, what's happening? Adrian, U.S. President Donald Trump has tested positive for COVID-19. Earlier tonight, Trump announced that he and First Lady Melania Trump were awaiting the results of a test he took recently and would begin what he called a quarantine process. Moments ago, though, the president tweeted that the results are, in fact, positive. Trump saying tonight him and First Lady Melania have tested positive for the virus. They will begin their quarantine and recovery process immediately, saying we will get through this together. This comes after one of his most senior aides, Hope Hicks, te also tested positive for COVID-19. Hicks spends a lot of time with the president and traveled with him to Tuesday's debate in Cleveland. An administration official speaking on condition of anonymity says Hicks began feeling mild symptoms during the flight home from a rally in Minnesota last night. Trump was also on Fox News with an impromptu interview earlier tonight, and he was asked about the diagnosis. And I just went out with a test. I'll see what, you know, because we spent a lot of time and the first lady just went out with a test also. So whether we quarantine or whether we have it, I, I don't know. You know, it's very hard when you're with soldiers, when you're with uh, airmen, when you're with uh, the Marines and, uh, I'm with, and the police officers, I'm with them so much. And when they come over to you, it's very hard to say, stay back, stay back. We'll bring you any updates on the president's situation tonight. His doctor says both he and the first lady are doing well. Again, Donald Trump has COVID-19. Adrian, back to you. At least one person is dead after the accidental opening of a dam in North Vancouver today. Local media video shows that powerful wall of water rushing out of the Cleveland Dam this afternoon. Officials say several people were caught downriver. Two were able to make it to shore on their own and two others are in stable condition after being rescued from a sandbar. City officials say it was an unexpected gate release during maintenance. There's more fallout today at the Quebec hospital where an indigenous woman was verbally abused by staff shortly before she died. An orderly is the second person to be fired after a nurse was let go. And we're learning the experience of Joyce Echequan is similar to what a man told the Quebec government more than a year ago about that very same hospital. Sarah Levitt explains. Alain Flamand says nurses at Joliet Hospital kept saying he was there just for the drugs. Just because I'm indigenous doesn't mean I'm on drugs, he says. Flamand says the death of Joyce Echequan left him in shock. The Atikamek woman died Monday, but not before filming the insults she faced. Family says Echequan dealt with racism at the hospital often, something Flamand can relate to. He spoke about it before the Vienne Commission in 2018. The inquiry looked into the treatment of Indigenous people in the province's public service. In 2017, Flamand went to the hospital five times over six months with severe back pain. Instead of getting checked, he was given pain medication and told to rest. Finally, fed up, he made the trek to Trois-Rivières, where he was admitted for emergency surgery. Many in Manawan avoid getting medical help at all. It's really serious. They just don't go. Many of them don't go. And they are more sick. They, they die younger. As the MNA for Joliet, Verané Kivon says Echequan's story is tragic. I'm sorry, I think it's a little difficult. Uh, I was uh, totally shaken. Yvon says the Vienne Commission was already full of examples of failures in the health system. 
cultural barriers, inequalities in access to service, and a complaint process rife with prejudice. Premier François de Gaulle says he's been in touch with Echequan's partner. He says the government takes the recommendations from the commission seriously but was sidelined by the pandemic. Flamand says he doesn't expect to see change. I could have easily been in Joyce's place, he says, me and many others. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. A Calgary high school is under fire for suspending students who went public about their principal using the N-word. The students who, in this case, were doing the right thing. By... The reaction, next. And fighting for change in Canada's universities. I had been at a blackface party while I was at a bar. I was told several times to go back to my country. How thousands of students and faculty are working to end racism. Plus, Marvel's newest superhero is yet another Canadian. We're back in two. Welcome back. The federal government has reintroduced a bill aimed at ending so-called conversion therapy. It has no basis in science or in healthcare practices. Bill C-6 would make it a criminal offense to force a person to undergo therapy aimed at altering their sexual orientation or their gender identity. The original bill died in August when Parliament was prorogued. And the RCMP has reversed its mask-wearing policy after being accused of discriminating against officers who keep beards for religious reasons. Once the pandemic hit, frontline officers were required to wear properly fitted N95 masks. Those who weren't able to were reassigned to desk duty. Those officers will now be able to return to the regular duties without, with appropriate PPE. A group of black Calgary students has been suspended for sharing a conversation with their principal in which the principal used the N-word. As Carolyn Dunn tells us, the school board is defending her. Last week, outside this Calgary school, a group of black students was overheard using the N-word. The principal told them why they shouldn't. One of the students was recording as the principal said this. So how come it's okay for you to say the word n A family of one student posted it online. It's okay for black people to use that word because it is a word that we are reclaiming that is used to oppress black people. And if you are not black and you are using that word, you are using it as an oppressor. A spokesperson for the school district says the principal was trying to educate the students. They had a conversation with the students involved and they referenced the N-word in an effort to kind of explain why it's unacceptable language. The principal is not being disciplined for using a racial slur to explain why the racial slur is not okay. Instead, multiple students have been suspended. They're only being disciplined for having recorded a conversation, taken clips out of context and po posting that conversation online. That's against the school's code of conduct. But some legal experts say that code and the punishment are infringing on the students' charter rights. I hope they are sued for trying to interfere with the freedom of expression of their students, who in this case were doing the right thing. What's happened at this school illustrates how the response to racist language can overtake the incident itself. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. Anti-black racism and black inclusion are being tackled at a virtual conference by 3,000 students and dozens of post-secondary institutions. As Deanna Sumanak Johnson explains, they are working to create a strategy for institutions to tackle both. Binta Sise says she never thought of her skin color while in her native Gambia, but she was made aware of it when she enrolled at the University of British Columbia. Last year, the African-Caribbean student club she belongs to was accused of stealing a debit machine lent to groups for events. We were all so stressed out because there was a $1,000, I think, fee. And yeah, it turned out that she gave it to someone else. Experiences like hers aren't rare in Canadian universities. Being a black student comes along with a lot of challenges and barriers. Which is why today and tomorrow, 
54 of Canada's post-secondary institutions are engaging in what they're calling national dialogue on anti-black racism. 3,000 participants, faculty, students and administrators will engage in virtual sessions meant to bring difficult issues into the open. How do we make sure that we create pathways for people to come into the institutions, but that when they're there, they're supported to thrive, that they're uh, enabled to be the best of themselves. The goal of the gathering is to produce a charter of policies and best practices that all participating institutions will sign. I was told several times to go back to my country. This author of an autobiographical book on race on campus says the initiative is a good start. There's been a lot of saving face. Schools have been doing town halls and putting reports together for a long time. So I'm hoping that this time it actually sticks, that there's some regulations around it. Binta Sise, for one, is hopeful. Imagine going through university and your experiences are not good at all. It's also going to affect your frame of reference when you go out into the world. A step towards fixing up the institutions that pride themselves on openness and nurturing of young minds, all young minds who enter them. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Still ahead on The National, how Chrissy Teigen and John Legend's heartbreaking story of loss has resonated with parents around the world. But first, politics and the pandemic and trying to break the second wave. That issue is here. Rosie? Adrian, we're going to look at how governments are managing this moment of the pandemic, from the political challenges to the opportunities. Are decisions more difficult for governments this time around? Chantal, Andrew, and Althea will answer that and more, and we'll see you right after the break. I know we've made some tough decisions in recent days, but they are lives in danger, and fighting the virus must remain our top priority. Yesterday's modeling data was a wake-up call. We could have a 1,000 cases a day by mid-month. So again, I have to keep saying, please don't let your guard down. Cases of COVID-19 continue to rise in several parts of the country, and so too do the political challenges. How are governments managing this second wave of the pandemic, and at what cost? It's Thursday, and I'm here with At Issue, Chantal Hébert, Andrew Coyne, and Althea Raj. Good to see everybody. Uh, it's Quebec and Ontario, obviously, experiencing the biggest surge in cases, but B.C. is also struggling a bit. Uh, Alberta has seen a rise. And it's interesting to watch the different kinds of responses versus the first time round, where we we were all sort of, you know, just trying to figure out how to deal with it. Andrew, how much, how much more difficult do you think it is politically or, or trying to deal with this the second time? Are, are there things that they should know better or, or do differently? Or is the pressure uh, sort of too much now the second time around? Well, it's, I think it's both easier and harder. It's easier in the sense that we know a little bit more than we did in March when we were basically completely in the dark about causes, sources, et cetera. We have a bit more uh, data now, a bit more, I think, potential for a more surgical approach than a pure across-the-board shutdown. But it's harder in the sense that people are less frightened, uh, frankly. In, mm -hmm. in the spring, uh, there was a, a, a real ability to mobilize the public for collective action on this because the numbers were so horrifying. Um, uh, the numbers seemed, until recently, to be less troublesome. But, of course, the nature of this kind of thing is, is the exponential growth can, can come at you like a freight train. So it's, uh, I think it's, it's a little more difficult to get the public to really pay attention and really focus in on uh, the dangers involved here uh, and, and to gather that kind of consensus. And, and there's also, you know, what everyone calls sort of COVID fatigue, whether that be from the public health perspective or from sort of not being allowed to do anything and the economy being restricted. Chantal, what does that, how, how, more how much more challenging does that make it politically? I think the real challenge is that you've gone from uh, shutting everything down to a balancing act, uh, and, and that is where the struggle really is, uh, both in Quebec and Ontario. It's clear, and that would be the case no matter who would be premier, uh, that uh, premiers want to keep schools open, but cases are rising. It was a lot easier to just shut everything down. Yeah. They are desperately trying to avoid that. 
uh, and, and kind of making it up as they go along. And every time that they impose new restrictions, I've seen in Quebec uh, this week, people are trying to find the thread line. It was easy to see the thread line when you were shutting everything down, but why are you shutting down theaters and not um, hair salons? Yeah. Uh, was the question this week. So it's it's a lot tougher, and it requires a lot more uh, tweaking from day to day to day without knowing if it's going to work. Yeah, and, and the messaging is confusing, too. We, Elamine and I talked about it on the podcast this week. You know, you say to people, don't go out and, and make sure you're not socializing, but you're keeping bars and restaurants open in, in Ontario anyway. So it, it's kind of it, it kind of makes it difficult, I think, in some ways, Althea, for governments to be coherent or for people to hear a coherent message. Inconsistent messaging. I would sure. agree with everything and echo what Andrew and Chantal said. But the other thing is that the public is now armed with a lot more information than they themselves had. Forget about sure. the, the provinces. So we are doubting the information that our politicians are telling us and the medical officers of health. And we are questioning uh, the guidance that they are giving us because it is inconsistent compared to the spring. Stay home, only go out if you absolutely need to, pick one person to do your groceries. Now you're saying, send your children to a classroom with 30 other kids, several of your children if you have several children in school, exposing yourself to multiple people. If you're in Quebec, the premier is saying, well, but then you can't have anybody from another address come visit you at the same time in your house unless you live alone. In Ontario, they're saying you can still do in-room dining, but we are the classrooms are still going to be 30 plus kids, not 15, as we originally told you in the spring, which was the the guidance from the healthcare experts. Mm -hmm. So there is less willingness, I think, from for people to participate in this like uh, communal project, if yeah. you wish. The well, it, the yeah. other thing I think is that we are starting to blame governments for decisions that the public think don't make any sense. That, that we we think that they should have been prepared. They had six months to prepare for back to school. They don't seem to have done a great job about it. In Ontario, for example, we had 80,000 backlogs of cases. So, you know, then there's an expectation for people, well, you told us back in June to go get tested if we had no symptoms. Now you're saying if you have a runny nose, stay home, but you're also telling us that your kid probably 17% of them, the kids that had COVID had runny noses. None of this makes any sense. Uh, no. So I think that is really where, where the trouble lies. And, and the federal government, too, is, is, is trying to respond to all of this in different ways because it's obviously different across the country, as we've talked about today, announcing a $10 billion infrastructure spending announcement. And, and I want to play a little bit of what the prime minister had to say about why that's happening now. We are, of course, uh, primarily concerned with uh, the situation uh, facing so many communities around the country with the second wave of COVID-19. At the same time, though, as people are struggling through this pandemic, people are also uh, thinking about what's next. What lessons have we learned from this pandemic? How we're going to build back better? I mean, that's a that's a, so Chantal mentioned a balancing act. I mean, that that's a balancing act too. Trying to see the opportunity as we're still facing the challenges, Andrew. Uh, opportunity, political and otherwise. Uh, I mean, I still think this is vulnerable to the critique that. Uh, he should be focusing on the specific task of fighting the pandemic. If there's a more core uh, uh, role for the state than public health, I don't know what it is. And yet, we've just been talking about the many ways in which governments have not been uh, addressing that, have not have, have been dropping the ball on that core responsibility. And at this very moment, it seems rather odd to be saying, let's expand that into all kinds of other sectors and all the kinds of other areas that have not previously been either federal or government responsibility. Uh, um, and to be doing so with a lot of borrowed money. Um, so, yeah, there's an opportunity there, I suppose, uh, because people are, you know, we've been so uh, thrown off of our previous uh, uh, benchmarks as to what fiscal responsibility amounted to. Uh, but I think there's also dangers there. Yeah, I mean, that, that announcement today also promised to create 60,000 jobs, which, I, you know, is part of their one million, dollar, one million job promise. And I guess part of that, Chantal, is about sort of lining things up when or if things ever get back to normal, too. Well, two things. Uh, for one, I think at this point it's harder to be a premier in Ontario, Quebec, or B.C. and Alberta than it is to be the prime minister. And that goes back to the fact that provinces are sovereign when it comes to health care. Uh, and when it comes to education. So they will be in the line of fire. When Paul Martin cut 
uh, the rate of increase of the health transfer. He got rewarded for uh, keeping public finances in good order federally, and the provinces paid a high price for the health care system cuts. So uh, up to a point, Justin Trudeau is not in a bad place. The other thing is I suspect the initial reaction to the Trump speech has probably uh, made the federal liberals feel freer about doing what they wanted to do, and that is that the reception when you look at, you know, two polls this week, it either strengthened or improved the liberal standing in the polls. So it seems that Trump's speech, uh, despite the fact that it was spanned by so many experts, did hit the mark. And then it's hard to argue that the federal government is doing uh, nothing that uh, is worth talking about when you have an uh, unanimous vote in the House of Commons yes. for the latest uh, relief package. Yeah, which was which was interesting because it was far more targeted than the initial aid package. That is something, I guess, that a lesson that government has already learned. Althea, your thoughts on, on how that balancing act that the prime minister sort of articulated today? Well, the infrastructure announcement is actually not really new. This $10 billion is part of their $180 billion infrastructure plan. It's all directed at things that they've outlined uh, previously, you know, green buses, climate adaptation, uh, broadband internet. These are things that we've talked about during the pandemic, but these are things that liberals had already committed to. And in some ways, you know, in the spring, we criticized them for shutting down parliament and basically being only focused on the COVID response. Everything else was on the back burner. They weren't moving on anything. So I'm not ready to criticize them at this point and say, well, hey, you're trying to show that you can walk and chew gum at the same time. I mean, I reserve judgment because the infrastructure bank has not been a resounding success. No. It has actually really not done much. Um, I think that part of what's happening in the prime minister's office and in the government writ large is that people are getting so used to this astronomical amounts of money, 10 billion here, 10 billion there, that they're just like, oh, we're just gonna keep piling and nobody will, <laughs> will notice whether we're $340 billion in deficit or $396 billion in deficit. Um, I, I think that that is kind of what is happening. And, and we're gonna see more and more um, legislation and actions that have basically been on hold since the spring yeah. come forward in this next session. Like yeah. just before the throne speech, I was told there were cabinet ministers had 40 pieces of legislation that they want to introduce this fall. Yeah. Okay. I, I got to leave it there. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Before we go, be sure to subscribe to Add Issue, the podcast for extra content, including the panel's take on this story. Will the Prime Minister admit his failure to approve rapid diagnostic testing is leading to the burnout in our frontline healthcare workers? You can find it on any major podcast app and, of course, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. For now, though, back to my friend Adrian in Toronto. All right, thanks, Rosie. Serious allegations of abuse have shuttered an elite training centre for Canadian athletes. I can't sleep at night being being the person who knows what's happening. The allegations and the investigation, next. Reports of verbal abuse have temporarily shut down the training center for Canada's top artistic swimmers, formerly called Synchronize Swimmers. CBC News has obtained a recording of the meeting where swimmers were told about an external investigation into the allegations. Jacinthe Taillon has our exclusive story. Canada Artistic Swimming shuttered the doors of its training center on Monday. Swimmers got the news at a meeting with Julie Healy, the chief sport officer. We obtained a recording of that meeting. We cannot continue to operate in an environment where athletes don't feel safe where the coaches don't feel that they can do their job without being accused of being hostile, harassing, abusive. In the last few days, emails alleging abuse were sent to the Federation, prompting an external investigation. Information that came in over the weekend via email was that um, we, our, our training environment was unsafe, that the, the athletes uh, were being forced to keep quiet about it and about harassment and abuse. So when you talk about um, allegations against who? The organization, Canned Artistic Swimming, the program, our coaching staff, me. Swimmer Claudia Holzner is shocked. I want to move forward. I want to make it to the Olympic Games. Obviously, 
you go through a lot of emotions when something like this happens. The investigation was sparked by an incident last Thursday at Montreal's Olympic Park pool. Some swimmers complained of comments about black people, Muslims and the LGBTQ community, allegedly made by the team's head coach, Gabor Zauder. Remarks that were so offensive to them, they complained to Healy that they no longer felt safe. CEO Jackie Buckingham says it's the first time she's heard about incidents of harassment and abuse at Canada Artistic Swimming. Club coaches say it's been going on for almost two years. Our people are not being investigated. Our issues are being investigated. I can't sleep at night being, being the person who knows what's happening and isn't doing anything. The external investigation will hear from club coaches, but it's the testimony of the swimmers themselves that will guide future steps, says the CEO. Jacinta Taillon, CBC News, Montreal. When we come back, how a celebrity story of loss has resonated with women around the world. We are alone when we're in those moments and you don't know who to turn to. You don't realize that one in four women has experienced loss. We'll be right back. Chrissy Teigen is a fashion model married to a superstar musician, but her online brand is Relatable Mom. She has shared so much about their family life, including their struggles to conceive a third child. So today's announcement hit especially hard. Teigen revealed she had lost that child in a miscarriage. The response has been overwhelming, in part because she's speaking so frankly about a subject we seldom discuss. Susanna Da Silva shows us how other women are breaking their silence to share their own ordeals. Wow, wow, wow. Pure joy for the world to see. Now piercing pain just as publicly on display. An Instagram post sharing the loss halfway through her pregnancy. We are shocked and in the kind of deep pain you only hear about. The kind of pain we've never felt before. The outpouring of support for Chrissy Teigen and husband John Legend has been profound. Stories of their own losses, some sharing them for the first time. When you're in those moments, it is hard to see beyond it. Lauren Asprin lived those moments, grieving the loss of twins at nine weeks, made worse by the fact it is a subject often whispered only among close friends. We are alone when we're in those moments and you don't know who to turn to. You don't realize that one in four women has experienced loss. Uh, one in six families go through infertility. Um, and it's not something that you want to talk about because it's hard and it's painful. But if we don't talk about it, then you don't know who you can go to who's had those experiences. Without those shared experiences, experts say the consequences can be devastating. I think when we shame something or cast something into the shadows, what we say is, this is on you, so to speak. And then the person looks inward and says, what did I do wrong? When we hear people's stories, then mothers see or fathers see, I'm not alone. I'm not alone in this pain. It will actually allow other people to come forward to the doctor and say, you know what, I'd like to begin to think that I could try again. Are you ready? <laughs> For aspirin, the grief was replaced with joy. Just because you are in the depths of despair does not mean that's where you will always be. And she hopes with more discussion of heartache can also come more stories of overcoming the pain to give hope for others. Susanna the Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. When we come back, a Canadian teenager joins the next generation of Marvel superheroes. Why she means so much to so many, right after this. At a time when the world needs all kinds of heroes, an 18-year-old actor from Mark, Ontario is set to become an inspiration to so many people. Iman Vellani has been chosen to play Marvel's first Muslim superhero in the new Disney series, Ms. Marvel, and that is our moment. Ms. Marvel is the superhero identity of a regular teenage girl living with her family in New Jersey. It's a huge role for the actor from Markham, Ontario. On Instagram, she posted speechless and excited. She's not the only one. Actor Kumail Nanjiani tweeted, I just saw that they cast Ms. Marvel and legit got teary-eyed. 
your work is going to mean so much to so many people. And actor-producer Mindy Kaling said what a joy in these trying times to see that Ms. Marvel, a Pakistani-American teen superhero, has cast its lead role, a young actress named Iman Vellani. Now, neither mentions that Vellani is Canadian, but we know. And she is just the latest Canadian to fill Marvel's film and TV ranks. Tatiana Maslany is set to star in a She-Hulk series. And Simu Liu from Kim's Convenience is playing Shang-Chi in a blockbuster movie out next summer. So Marvel needs superheroes and needs superheroes to represent. Canada's got this. So what's the story of this superhero? Well, she's just a young girl trying to protect her block and her corner store while balancing her, her faith, high school, and her newfound powers. And she'll be awesome. That is a national for Thursday, October the 5th. October the 1st? Second, I have no idea. Good night.